Hello there and welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec. My name is Steven Sims. I'm the curriculum lead for the SANS Institute for Offensive Operations. This is my first time on the show and I'm very excited to go over some very interesting details about our Hackfest conference coming up in November. I have a guest that will be will be joining with me a bit later, uh, Jean-Francois Mace, who also is an instructor with SANS and an author of one of our new courses, SAC 565, on red team operations. So we are going to get into many details about Hackfest and how we've meet, reimagined it for this year. It's the first time we're doing it in Hollywood, California. And I also want to weave in some really interesting uh, details about some of the talks that we'll be running and kind of some good content from us, some learning opportunities and lessons. So very excited to get to that point. Let's uh, see where folks are chiming in from here. Hello, Solomon, how are you? All right. Wow, there's a lot of people on, it's amazing. So Sweden, awesome. Hello, Sweden. Uh, what else do we have here? Atlanta, Georgia, Isaiah, hello. Northern Virginia, awesome. We have anybody from uh, Asia in the house? I haven't seen anybody pop up uh, there yet. I was just in Singapore and Bangkok. Oh, hello from Singapore, there we go, awesome. That's one of my favorite countries to visit because uh, they have this dish called chili crab and black pepper crab, and it's like the best food in the world if you're into that sort of thing. Hey there, Aiden from London. Wow, great people from all over, near Hollywood, sweet. So you have no excuse not to come to the event coming up here. <laughs> We have um, a couple cool questions as well that I want to propose to you and, and get your thoughts on it. Uh, I've been teaching penetration testing and red teaming and exploit development for uh, many, many, many years. And one thing I've always found interesting is when I'm teaching these exploit development and hacking courses, I always say, hey, in the classroom, how many of you are defenders? How many of you are offensive or penetration testing. And the majority of the students, almost every single class work in the defense side of the house, which I think is fantastic because we always hear that term, offense informs defense. So it's really interesting that we've got so many folks on the defensive side coming in. So one of the questions I'm gonna to propose to you a little bit later is about kind of where we are in terms of controls on the network and the cloud and some other interesting items that we will cover there. Uh, coming up in a moment here, we've got a nice blurb from our News Bites, and that one will be Thomas Wolf and Michelle Peterson. So let's just jump in with the uh, News Bites, and then I'll be back shortly. Hello, and welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec News Bites. I'm contributing editor Thomas Wolf here with editor in chief Michelle Peterson. And we have a great show for you today. Michelle, can you give us a rundown? Sure. In our first story, the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance released its list of top 12 vulnerabilities of 2022. Then we have news about a third vulnerability found in Avanti's MDM software. And in our last piece, we're going to cover Google's 2023 Threat Horizons report. Back to you, Thomas. Thanks, Michelle. I'll go ahead and start us off. Cybersecurity agencies from the US, Australia, Canada, the UK, and New Zealand, also known as the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, released a list of the top 12 most exploited vulnerabilities of 2022. They found that attacks are increasingly focused on outdated software vulnerabilities. And at the top of the list are Fortinet's Forta OS and Forta Proxy SSL VPN credential exposure vulnerability, followed by three Microsoft Exchange proxy shell vulnerabilities. In fact, Remote code executions accounted for six of the top 12 vulnerabilities. Not surprisingly, Microsoft was a vendor most targeted, holding five of the 12 spots on the list, followed by Atlassian and VMware, each holding two places on the list. The report urges vendors, designers, developers, and end user organizations to use the mitigations detailed in the report. For more information, go to the CISA.gov website. Michelle? Unified Endpoint Management Provider, Ivanti, has disclosed another vulnerability in its Endpoint Manager Mobile, formerly known as Mobile Ad Core Software. This is the third disclosed vulnerability in two weeks. This newest flaw is a critical authentication bypass vulnerability affecting Mobile Iron Core version 11.2 and older. Mobile Iron Core 11.2 has been out of support since March of 2022, so Avanti will not be providing patches to address the flaw. 
Instead, Avanti says the best thing to do is to upgrade to 11.3. According to Shodan, there are currently more than 2,200 mobile iron user portals exposed online, several of which are connected to U.S. local and state government agencies. CISA and the Norwegian National Cybersecurity Center released a joint advisory warning of active exploitation of the two earlier disclosed vulnerabilities. CISA has directed U.S. federal agencies to patch flaws by August 15th and 21st. Thomas? Thanks, Michelle. Google released its 2023 Threat Horizons report last week. The report provides decision makers with strategic intelligence about threats to cloud enterprise users, cloud-specific research, and recommendations from Google's intelligence and security teams. Notable in the report's findings, of all the cloud compromise factors observed by Google Cloud's incident response teams in the first quarter of 2023, 60% involved credentials issues. Another of the more interesting findings details a technique targeting Android users called versioning, which is used by threat actors to bypass Google Play Store's malware detection. With this tactic, an app passes Google's checks to be listed on the Google Play Store, and then later the adversary pushes malicious code to the end user device using dynamic code loading. It basically turns an Android device into a backdoor. And those are your SANS News Bites for this week. For more critical cybersecurity news and commentary from some of the sharpest minds in InfoSec, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bites newsletter, your twice weekly summary and analysis of the most significant cybersecurity developments. You can do so at sans.org backslash news bites. Thanks again. I'm your host, Michelle Peterson. And I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. Hope to see you again next week. Great. That was some awesome information. Every time I hear Google, I always think back to when they got hit with that Aurora attack. And that was probably 15 years ago now. But after that happened, Google then really quickly turned into one of the top, if not the most like secure oriented, security oriented company in the world. It's just super impressive stuff that they do along with Microsoft and other vendors as well. So I've got a question for you that I mentioned briefly a moment ago, and I wanna get your, your feedback. So how this works is you're going to, you can scan the QR code if you're brave, or you can go to the link. You're going to slido.com and it gives you the number. Slido is a really interesting tool where you can pose a question, for example, and we've all seen polls been given before, but this one allows you to enter in a response and then the response that gets the most likes and people that agree with that response, it bubbles up and gets bigger and bigger. And it shows you kind of where the majority of people are, are in agreement. So it's an awesome tool. My question for you, and I'm gonna give you a couple examples of it in a moment, is on your typical pen test or red team engagements, including your own company. So if you're pen testing your own organization, where do most companies sit with regard to network protection. And by network protection, what I'm referring to is, is it a flat network or is it segmented? Do you have controls like network access control, NAC? Do you have 802.1x for network level authentication? There are all kinds of different controls. You've seen a lot of organizations that get breached or compromised where when the compromise occurs, we find out that the organization is flat. And by flat, what I mean is that once an attacker is able to get access to a system in your environment, there are no internal protections on the network preventing that attacker from going straight from a user in the sales department to the data center, being able to access core servers and routers and switches. That is an example of what a flat network means. So network segmentation is when you add additional controls in. So go ahead and put your responses in. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, and we'll see what the biggest responses are and where we're in agreement. And we can talk about some of these controls in a bit more detail as to how they work. So I'll be back again in a moment to introduce my guest, Jean-Francois Mace. And first, we're going to have a quick segment on Taz Wake's new forensics course. Hi, my name's Taz. I'm here to give you a very quick introduction into a brand new SANS course called Forensics 577. That's the Linux Instant Response and Threat Hunting course. This is a course that's designed to take you as a SOC analyst or someone with a background in security already and teach you what you need to do to deal with an advanced threat actor if they pivot into a Linux environment, be that your web server, your proxies, your routers, your firewalls, 
we're going to be able to hunt down adversaries wherever they can hide. We're going to look at how the file systems work. We're going to look at the different operating systems, how their logging changes. We're going to focus very much on Red Hat and CentOS, though, just to make the course coherent. We'll look at a lot of tools that you can use. We'll look at triage collections. All in all, it's going to be an excellent way to turn you into a very, very highly skilled, highly functioning instant responder, whatever the threat actor is operating in. The course goes live later this year, but we've got a beta event coming up at San Europe in October in Prague, where you'll get the opportunity to see the course at a discounted rate. Really do look forward to seeing you all there. Awesome. So, sounds like an exciting course. So many courses. Um, I'm going to introduce my guest now, Jean-Francois, if you could join me here. And hey, magically, Steve. Magically, he appears. So, quick introduction of Jean-Francois. He is a SANS instructor and author. He's the lead author of one of our brand new courses on red team operations. It's a fantastic course to get you up and running as a red teamer. And even if you're an existing red teamer, it will help improve your skills there as well. So, Jean-Francois has an impressive background uh, working. If you've ever heard of Cobalt Strike, he's worked with that tool. He's worked at Inviso, a fantastic organization out of Belgium that does all kinds of security services, but primarily things like uh, consulting on penetration testing and assessments. And he'll tell you some more places he's been as well here in a moment. But <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I've asked Jean-Francois to join me because he is my co-chair for HackFest in Hollywood. So HackFest each year, we've been running it in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Virginia area, I think ever since its inception with Ed Scotus, who first started it. I believe it ran in Vegas one time, like over a decade ago, but for the most part, it's been in the D.C. area, which is great. But when you get into November in D.C., it gets quite cold, which not, is not necessarily a bad thing. But uh, this year, we wanted to do it in Hollywood. So Hollywood, California, we're doing it right there on the Walk of Fame. As you can see, a little slide deck I put together here. Uh, that, I believe, is the hotel where the very first Emmys were, were held, which is pretty neat. Now it's held across the street. But I'm a musician as well, and so like there's a lot of memories I have down in L.A., so it's just really cool to get down there and do this. And I will share a bunch of details as we go through here. What I want this segment to be for the rest of it is I want to talk about HackFest, but more importantly, I want to weave in and out of some really interesting uh, security items. If you've ever heard me lecture before or seen me before, you know I'm quite technical. I like to get really deep down into the weeds, and obviously we can't do that right now, but we can scratch the surface a bit and talk about some very interesting topics related to the types of talks that are going to be given at Hackfest this year. So Jean-Francois, I want to say a few words. Yeah, Steve, first of all, you really showed your age there when you talked about uh, Aurora. I had to actually Google that one <laughs> to figure out what that was all about. So yeah, no, uh, you're definitely right. Um, like you said, you're a very technical guy. I try to be as well, albeit a little bit less technical than you are. But I'm really impressed with the amount of submissions that we have gotten for, for Hackfest. It's pretty insane. Uh, over 60, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but that's probably the highest submission count that we've had so far for Hackfest. Yeah, for Hackfest, 100%, yep. Yeah, and a lot of it is also pretty technical as well. I think the uh, the review board is really going to have a, a hard time picking because uh, I think we lack a few days. We probably need to do this like a week instead of uh, only three days for, for it to all go uh, right. And on top of that, what I've also seen, which I thought was quite interesting, I don't know about you, Steve, but um, a lot of these talks are now getting into more and more cloud-specific items, which I think is pretty interesting because... As you obviously know, right, a lot of organizations obviously have on-prem um, stuff, but are migrating into the cloud in one way, shape or form. So it's quite interesting to see that um, that the offensive research is also picking up on that and that there's quite a, uh, uh, quite a few really good submissions, actually, uh, that are going to talk about uh, that cloud stuff as well. So I'm pretty, pretty excited for that. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um... I want to say this one more time. I encourage you to ask questions, especially related to the content that we're going to go through. I, I love Q&A, so if you have a question, we won't be able to get to everything, obviously, and I'm going to count on the powers that be in the background to make sure that they bubble up and make it so we see these great questions and we don't miss too many. So if we can jump back over to the slide deck real quick. So we, we know where it's going to be, right there in downtown LA in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel. Now, 
let's jump forward here and talk about our amazing keynotes. So if you've ever heard of Chompy, that's her handle on Twitter and other places. Her name is Valentina Palmiotti. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But she is beyond brilliant. Uh, very one, Every once in a while, you see someone just come out of nowhere and they just start like dropping amazing exploits and research to the world. And she is absolutely one of these individuals. And we're very thankful to have her as our day one keynote. She did a session with me. I have a, a stream on YouTube called Off by One Security. And I try to do it every Friday. Jean-Francois has been a guest on that as well. And we try to get really technical. So it's an opportunity for me to go into the weeds if we want to go there. And usually they're about an hour long. This one with Chompy took about two plus hours, might have been two and a half. Uh, same thing with Connor McGar, another individual I'll mention up here soon. So on that session, she talked about a vulnerability that was patched by Microsoft and as you all know, Patch Tuesday is a thing. Every second Tuesday of the month, Microsoft drops the patches for the month. And there are typically a lot of them to go through. So there's this technique called one day exploitation or end day exploitation. We've all heard of zero days. A zero day is when all of a sudden there's an exploit running in the wild. No one's disclosed it to the affected vendor. There's no patch available. No one had heard of this thing before. And now everyone's got to run around and try to protect themselves until a patch is available. And then we have to patch. So that is pretty much the most powerful thing that you can have is a, is a zero day that affects some big service like MSRPC DCOM or um, a web server vulnerability or DNS or something that's semi-public. Now, this end day or one day exploitation is the next best thing to having a zero day. And how it works is that when Patch Tuesday comes out, attackers, researchers, defenders, we all download the patches and most of us download them to just go and apply them. But what we do is we extract the patches and we take the patched file, and of course, there are going to be many patched files. Let's say the vulnerability that we are interested in affects the Windows kernel. Well, if we know it affects the kernel, the file that we're going to look for, probably, in the extracted patches is ntoskrnl.exe. That's the ntos kernel, and it's an executable. So we would now have a copy of that extracted updated kernel version, and we'd use special tools to run a differential against the most recent version of the kernel prior to this update that we just got. So we're taking the one that we currently have on our system that's updated all the way to today, then patches come out, we take that version that we have and diff it against the one that just dropped, that just came out, that we haven't applied yet. What we end up getting is a very small, if we do it right, a very small list of functions that have code changes in them. So normally, if you're looking at the Windows kernel, for example, there might be 50,000 functions. And if we're trying to find out where the code changes are within 50,000 functions, that's not going to happen unless we have these special tools. When we run these special tools out of those 50,000, it might show us that only two functions have code changes. Now, we know those code changes are related to the vulnerability that's been patched. So we can zoom in on those specific functions all the way down to the code and identify what the bug was. If possible, if we're good, and if we don't have too many obstacles, we can try and weaponize the vulnerability into a working exploit. Now, you might say, well, it's been patched, though. Yeah, but how many people patch immediately when Patch Tuesday comes out? We've seen over and over again that many organizations are bad at patching. Maybe it takes you a couple weeks or months to roll those patches out. Maybe you have to skip certain systems or certain patches. We see it happen all the time. So again, to summarize, one day exploitation or end day exploitation is when a patch comes out, we take the patch, we diff it against the unpatched version, we find the vulnerability, we weaponize it, we win. If you've got that power as a red teamer or other, and you're doing a red team engagement, and you're like, oh man, this organization has, uh, they don't, tr they have zero trust and, and they have all these controls and I can't get in. Oh, Patch Tuesday just happened. Let me see if I can weaponize one of these patched vulnerabilities because I doubt the organization has patched all their systems. If I can do that quickly, boom, we're in. So I said all this to say then that Chompy, 
our day one keynote at Hackfest, she and Ruben Boonen, who is another one of our speakers, you'll see on the next slide in a moment, they worked together a couple months ago to do exactly what I just said. And they were able to weaponize the vulnerability in less than 24 hours. So patch Tuesday, patch comes out. Wednesday, you've got a working exploit. That is very impressive. Not many people are capable of are able to do that. So very thankful to have her fly out and be our day one keynote called Security Research as a Service, not just for nation states. On top of that, Steve, I also, like sometimes you can also find new zero days, right? If you uh -huh. see that a patch got that, that a vulnerability got patched, but they actually messed up the patch, which sometimes happens as well. You could potentially weaponize it to get a new zero day. That's, that's quite a, interesting. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Thanks for mentioning that because I've, I personally have absolutely done exactly what Jean-Francois just said, which is I take a patch, extract it, find the vulnerability, and then you can use the information about the vulnerability or the unpatched code, and you can search for the exact same type of vulnerability in other places and sometimes it's just one function away you've got the exact same bug because due diligence didn't happen very common so yes you can absolutely use the knowledge about how microsoft patched something or other vendors not just microsoft and find other instances of that same type of vulnerability so our day two keynote is lena lao she will be flying out from australia all the way to hollywood to do our day two keynote and as jean francois mentioned earlier cloud she's doing a talk on hacking the cloud like an apt a lot of these sessions i've done on off by one security stream on youtube have been cloud oriented because like it or not COVID really accelerated cloud services and our migration from on-prem into the cloud and most organizations have a combination of the two so those are our two keynotes which it's going to be fantastic and i wish it was november already oh Here's something. People love to talk about money. Not everybody, but some, right? Money is interesting in relation to exploitation, of course. So this is, if you haven't seen it, Zerodium is a company that pays you for exploits that you write. If you find a zero day and you weaponize it and you don't tell anyone or give it to anyone and you go straight to this company, they may buy it from you. And look at the price tags. I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, but on the left, we've got computers like desktops and servers on the right we've got mobile devices like your android phone and your ipad or i you know iphone so if you look at the right at the very top it says 2.5 million us dollars for an android fcp zero click so what does that mean full chain persistence zero click what we're saying there is zero click normally if we're doing phishing for example i send you an email I use ChatGPT, of course, to generate the, uh, the the messaging, the wording, and you click on a link that then and takes you somewhere and you get infected. That required a click. Zero click is, imagine if I can just text you some file and you don't, you, you don't do anything. It just comes to your phone and your phone has now been rooted. In other words, someone's been able to exploit it and get complete system access over your phone. They can access your camera, your microphone, your files, anything they want. 2.5 million. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what do they do with this exploit when you give it to them? Well, they have customers and the customers have requested these types of exploits. So they will give them to the uh, appropriate customer. That's exactly what's happening. So what is the exploit being used for then? Bad stuff, right? I mean, this this is a for-profit organization. This is not like responsible disclosure when you go to Microsoft or Apple and you say, hey, I found a vulnerability that allows me to root the whole phone. Th they'll pay you, but it won't be nearly as much as what you can get out in the wild from other types of buyers. And there are all types of buyers out there nation states so governments absolutely will buy exploits for you now you don't pull up in your tesla and knock on the front door of the nsa right we don't do that but there are proxies there are companies out there that will buy exploits and then give it to the appropriate uh intelligence agency that they're working with and this happens all around the world so very interesting stuff but other instances or examples 
uh, someone may buy it to, and this has happened before, uh, to go and, and track journalists. So if you're in a country where they're very protective about the outward messaging, then they may want to keep tabs and track of journalists that they consider to be rogue. And if they can use that exploit to be able to hack in to this person of interest devices, that's terrifying. And there's actually been some very awful things that have happened to uh, individuals in with that example. I won't go into details there, but you can imagine there are there are responsible buyers out there like ZDI, Tipping Point, and uh, iDefense that used to be at VeriSign and it was acquired by someone. But there are responsible disclosure methods that you can use or processes that you can follow, and they will go and make sure that the vulnerability gets patched. But I just wanted to bring this up as an example, because if you read through some of those applications that aren't worth as much money as the full rooting of the box, but like up to $500,000 for signal. So if you can hack someone's device who uses a signal app, obviously that's used for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. Chrome, so browser-based exploitation. WhatsApp, very popular. So you can see kind of what the interests are. And you I know the, people- uh, You have the point to own contest as well, Steve. That you can absolutely uh, use. yeah talk tell, tell them about that a bit yeah so for those of you who don't know point to own is a i think it's a yearly contest not 100 percent sure but yeah, i think yeah. so where uh vendors essentially um create a contest about uh about some software that they deem in scope and historically speaking in the old days right when you did point to own and you were actually able to get code execution onto some device, you'd actually get the device as a reward, hence point to own, right? If you point a device, you own it. Um, nowadays, historically though, it evolved over time, obviously as more and more, it's actually about software, right? So for example, Exchange is uh, definitely one of those um, softwares out there that typically get exploited in a point to own. I think uh, last year Teams was also uh, exploited to get a remote code execution. So uh, when that happens, obviously the, the researchers won't get as much bounty as Steve just mentioned, right? With these uh, intermediary providers that are selling them to whatever state is uh, bidding the highest. But it's more about honor, right? Because that's the responsible disclosure. You're, you're disclosing it directly to the vendor who can then apply a patch. And you get uh, point to own po points in the contest as well. And then every year you have the, uh, the point to own master, right? Whoever acquired uh, the most po points in the point to own contest is uh, the ultimate hacker of that year, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it used to be a long time ago when you're doing this stuff, like no one really cared about it. You're called a geek. Nobody likes you. And now you like, you know, you're like the popular person if you're able to do this stuff and you're a rock star, basically, because this is super hard nowadays. I like to talk about the golden era of hacking, which is subjective. But my thought on the what is the golden era of hacking is back in like the 90s to the mid 2000s, there were no protections. There weren't any like very minimal, it might be a firewall here and there, but patching, haha, when does that happen, right? The administrators had to go from system to system and you had firewalls that if they were there, it was only inbound protection and no outbound protection. So I remember when MSRPC DCOM, if you're old enough to remember the blaster worm, when that came out, Metasploit came out at the, around that same time in 2003. And that particular vulnerability, it was exploitable on every system, you could just basically put the IP address in the Metasploit, hit exploit, and boom, you've got a shell on that system. It was just crazy how easy it was. And even and, even ISPs never heard of segmentation, right? Everyone was just connected to the same network. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, just just it was just easy and and very simple techniques. Which nowadays, when you learn introductory exploitation techniques today it looks super simple and you're like it was that easy for these people back in the 90s well yes but this was all new back then so most people didn't know this stuff and learning it was very hard and there wasn't any research there was no google this particular thing and find out a bunch of information because someone's already reverse engineered it and explained it to you you had to learn all this yourself but it was the golden era because there was no protection it was interesting. Let's jump back to the slides for a moment. So if we move on here, this is these are two confirmed talks. Now, as Jean-Francois said, we have over 60 
submissions for our CFP call for papers presentations. And that's a lot of work to go through. I have a, a slide coming up in a moment that shows our advisory board, the individuals who are responsible for making the decisions as to who will be one of the presenters. These two individuals I directly reached out to because I know that they are going to deliver some amazing work. I had Connor McGar on my off by one security stream I'll talk about him in a moment. And then also Ruben Boonen is the individual that I mentioned previously who worked with Chompy to weaponize that patched vulnerability within 24 hours. So these are very technical people. And Connor McGar, when he was on my session, it went for two and a half hours. And he was showing us a very interesting technique around how you can get like a right primitive in kernel mode. So you might not be familiar with that term, right primitive. What we're talking about there is the ultimate power that we want if we are exploiting a process is to get control of code execution of the program counter or instruction pointer. This is a special register, a processor register that points to the next address where code execution will continue. So if we can get control of that pointer, we then have the ability to control what gets executed super powerful. Well, Microsoft and other orgs as well and vendors have been working really hard to break our techniques. So if I get code execution on your system, on your process, I may not be able to do what I want to do because there's all these protections there trying to stop me. And he showed us an example of how you can elevate your privileges so go from a normal user up to like an admin without having to execute any code, with just moving things around. So it's a really interesting talk. What's fascinating about it, even more so, is the next day or week, I can't remember, someone, sometime in the next week after that presentation, Microsoft came out with a the preview version for the next month, was including a patch that stopped the technique that Connor was using in that presentation, which it may have just been a coincidence or not, but that's pretty crazy because it's always this cat and mouse game where vendors are trying to break our techniques that we discover. It used to be the case that these techniques we used were tried and true and they just worked all the time and it was super cool. An example is return oriented programming, if you've heard of that. They've been going after, they being vendors, have been going after breaking that technique instead of looking at the root cause, basically treating the symptoms and trying to break the techniques that we've relied on for so long. And when they kill one of those techniques or kill a bug class, you pour out a little uh, Hennessy or whatever and you move on to the next technique. You gotta find a new technique. So it's gone from being able to use these widely publicized and very trustworthy techniques to now we're at a point where it's a lot of one-offs. And by one-offs, I mean, you got to find a new way to get something to happen. And that's why those prices that we saw a moment ago are so high. This is our advisory board. I just want to give a shout out to them because they've got a lot of work ahead of them. Uh, they've already been doing some of the work, but they've got a lot more work to do. We're going through our second round of reviews right now to try to determine which speakers will be presenting in Hollywood. So actually, Jean-Francois, I'd like for you to go over some of the additional workshops and interesting things that we're gonna be doing aside from just the, the amazing talks. Yeah, sure, thanks, Steve. Um, so there is going to be a amazing CTF that is going to take place. And uh, you can actually see uh, the mastermind of the CTF on the, on the slides right there. It's Barry Darnell. He's always uh, doing uh, CTF-y things, right? Uh, he's also well known for the, uh, the Red Team Village at DEF CON. So for those of you who are heading there as well, you probably uh, will bump into, uh, into Barrett as well. Um, is that confirmed, Steve, that we're once again doing the, the IoT um, stuff as well or not? I'm... I would say 90%. Yeah, it's probably okay. going to happen. Yeah, so we're also going to do an, uh, an IoT hack, uh, hack workshop, which is amazing. Last year was very popular. Mick actually gave that workshop as well. So Mick, you can also see on the slide, by the way, it's like we planned this out, right? <laughs> um, so if, you, uh, if you're interested in 
going actually back to the good old days because Steve just talked about that, right? When uh, when it uh, when when it was the nineties, it was a lot easier. Well, we still see nowadays that in a lot of IoT devices, we're actually seeing a blast from the past where a lot of these older exploit techniques actually still work, right? The, the bug classes are still there. Mm -hmm. um, typically also in like web interfaces, you could find remote code execution there. So uh, quite interesting stuff uh, going on uh, on top of the talks. And um, it's also going to be combined with uh, the blockchain um, summit as well. So we will have some virtual talks about blockchain and Web3 uh, as well, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah, and the, speaking on the IoT thing, like I said, I want to we want to weave in talking about the event and also just cool stuff and you know interesting security topics. We started our very first IoT hacking night. I would say it's probably eight, nine years ago at this point, maybe even ten. And we did it in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace at our network security event that runs once a year. And James Lyon and myself were the two that put this thing together. And of course, if you don't, I don't know if you know James Lyon, but he's an amazing individual and hysterically, he's just brilliant and funny. And like, it wasn't enough to have our first IoT hacking night. He's like, we have to make it with drones too. We have to have hacking the drone. So it's like, okay, James, we'll do drone hacking as well. So he was responsible for all the drone hacking stuff. So imagine you're in a, in a big, big ballroom with hundreds of people. There was definitely like at least two to 300 people. And there's a bar in the back, of course, because you know you can't hack IoT without a drink. And um, a table up in the front of the room had all these crazy products on it. Like, I kid you not, some of these products, and I was responsible for buying them, so I had fun with that, was a smart water bottle to, tr to track your water consumption throughout the day, and it told you you need to drink more. It, we had a smart egg carton. So if you're at the grocery store and you wonder if you have eggs, it will tell you how many eggs you have left in your refrigerator, as well as whether or not they're still good. We had a crock pot for cooking. We had cameras, routers, um, smart plugs, smart lights. We had smart watches. That One of children's the... toy as well, right? Yes, I was just going to go to that. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the little story I was going to tell. So um, one of the products that I bought was this uh, stuffed animal, and it was a Bluetooth stuffed animal. So. The idea behind it was you give it to your child and when you're out traveling, for example, you can through your phone record a message that delivers, goes to your child's toy at home in their bedroom. And the little light on the toy blinks when it's when there's a message so the kid knows to click on it. So you click on it, it says, hey, I love you, miss you, whatever. That's how it's supposed to work. So that was one of the things that I brought. And. I had to go extract the firmware from all this stuff, which is a nightmare. Jean-Francois knows that. Um, extracting firmware from some of these IoT devices can be a, quite the nightmare. For I think that one in particular, I had to actually set up a packet sniffer, and I had to. You get one shot because <laughs> once the firmware is updated, you can't go back and buy another one. And so I set up a packet sniffer, and had it all locked down. So the only way that this thing could have gotten to the internet is through the access point I wanted. And I, I initiated the firmware update and I captured the firmware getting downloaded from the target site. And that's an example of extracting it or, or ac getting access to it. And then students in the room could go to the server and download all the firmware versions or from all the toys products. And these two individuals, I'll call them out by name because they're friends of mine and they were brilliant that day. Oh, every day, I guess, but that day in particular. Um, <laughs> this was uh, two guys from Dominican Republic, and they're probably the top hackers over there. It's uh, Petrolsky is one of them. I won't say the last name. And Wasker, I won't say the last name on that one either, but they, those two guys. So they were like determined to hack that toy. I don't know why, but they wanted to get that one. They worked together and they found a hidden command. There was a hidden command in the toy where if you issue this command, it would record whatever's happening in the room, the audio in the room for up to a certain amount of time. And you could run it over and over again. So it was determined that this used Bluetooth low energy and there was no authentication required. So here's the scenario. Someone's sitting in front of your house on the street in their car with an antenna. They're able to reach the signal of the toy and they're able to interact with it. There's no authentication required. They then issue this command that starts recording what's going on in the house. So it's a spy device, basically. This ended up, it resulted in getting pulled down from stores. 
uh, off the off the shelf. So that's like one example of something interesting. That, and there's many other stories, but we don't have time for all that. But I just find that stuff fascinating, and that's why we do it. It's partially for fun and for learning, and also it's a community service because we then turn this stuff over to the affected vendor and we help them patch it up. There was another one with a, a watch that had a hidden command on it as well, which is just terrifying to think that that's actually happening. So as Jean-Francois mentioned, those are some examples of the workshops, lock picking, uh, IoT village, uh, maybe some virtual reality stuff. Last year we had a VR setup where you could uh, get yourself out of a metaverse room. It's like escape room, but metaverse style. And you had to wear the VR headset to do it. It involved NFTs and all kinds of cool stuff, like just really interesting stuff. And on, we always do something neat on one of the nights. And for this particular night that we're gonna do this event, we've rented out the rooftop of the Roosevelt. So if I go back here to this image, look at the very top of the hotel on the left. And you can see where it's got that little awning and like little, looks like a little patio under the sign. Well, it is a patio. That is the penthouse on the roof. And that's where we're gonna have kind of like an evening get together with hacking, of course. I'm, I'm thinking hacker trivia, we'll have some of the IoT hacking. So up there in the penthouse of the Roosevelt overlooking Hollywood, hacking away. It just sounds really fun to me if you're a geek, I guess, but <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, so I haven't seen many questions pop up. Like now is the chance, actually, while you're thinking of your question, and please do that, type up your questions. If I missed it, I'm sorry, put it back up there, we will get to it. But let's go back over to our poll results. We asked that question around what type of network protection is often used. We have very little results, which is sad. Um, if you still got a chance, I think, to go in there and put something in. But we see segmented defense in layer, which like defense in depth, multi-factor authentication, our network is flat, unfortunately. Yeah, sadly, that's still that's still the way. Um, we we teach in one of the class or many of the classes. So a lot of times, penetration testing starts off with access to a port or a wireless access point. And it used to be, when you plug into a port, you get a DHCP address. You've got an IP address that comes to you magically, and and you can access the internet maybe if there's no proxy and it lets you do that, or you can. Um, and hello from New Jersey. And you can uh, you can get to various services and devices on the network. I, I should not be able to. Let's imagine I'm I'm going to the doctor's office and I bring my laptop bag. You're allowed to do that. What do they always do when you go into the doctor's office? The doctor will be right with you. Twenty minutes later, the doctor comes in. So meanwhile, you just open your laptop and you plug into the network port that's there, right next to the old Windows Seven box. They're still running. That's unlocked. So you plug into this port on the wall and you get an IP address. And then I'm like, okay, let me run a little uh, port scan. And I find all these networks and devices. I'm like, let me try SSHing after I fingerprint some of these devices. And I SSH to a box and it's a core router or it's a server that's running in the data center. I should not be able to do that. I should not be able to get from a doctor's office room all the way to the core data center of their enterprise, which is probably in another city. That's a flat network. It's an example of what we're talking about. We don't want that, um, well, or, attackers do. Or a classic other example, when there is segmentation, right? You just walk to the nearby printer or a voiceover telephone. You take a look at the MAC address, which you typically find, and then you just spoof that MAC address and boom, yep. you're in again, so yeah. Im impersonation is a, is a beautiful thing when you're hacking. You can basically use like a Linux box and Let's, let's say a silly analogy. Let's say a, a bank says, no one's allowed in the bank vault unless you're a clown. So people are gonna dress up like a clown and go in, right? So a lot of organizations, they're like, we're gonna lock down our environment and they do this well. And only certain devices are allowed on the network and you have to authenticate to a NAC server and all this and all that. But when you make things too secure, some things break. So therefore you have to allow for exceptions exceptions like John Francois mentioned a, mentioned a printer. A printer can't interact with a NAC device and start typing in a username and password, but it needs to access the network. Or all these IoT devices that we talked about, like cameras, HVAC systems, security cameras, others, uh, your 3D printer, it's one I've seen. So if these devices need, need exceptions, that means they don't have to authenticate. So what I can do, is dress up my Linux box and make it look like one of these devices that are on the exceptions list. Jean-Francois mentioned change the MAC address. Sure, we can do that. 
We can change the user agent string to make it look like we're a particular browser. We can change the way our IP traffic looks so that from a network packet perspective, it looks like that device. I'll give you an example. You've probably heard of a, a time to live. Time to live is something simple that's there where let's say, um, I'm home and I want to access a server that's on another network. Each time we hit a router and we're go traversing across the internet, that's called a hop. And each hop, we can decrement or increment this counter for time to live. And we can say, well, we only want, and this is to prevent loops. We don't want loops on the internet where a packet is sitting there going in a circle forever. We want that to time out eventually. So if we set the time to live to 100, after 100 hops, if the packet doesn't reach its destination, it just dies, it drops, and to prevent loops. So by default, a Windows system, I believe, has a time to live of 128, and a lot of Linux boxes, 255. So let's say that a NAC server is validating that you are this particular Linux box, and it's one of the checks it's doing is looking at the time to live to make sure it's within a particular area. Like if there's this device that we want to pretend that we are and its default time to live is 200. Typically, there's only a few jumps we have to do, make, a few hops we have to make to get to a destination. So let's say it's 193 by the time it reaches the server. Okay, well, it's within a reasonable range that indicates that its time to live was probably 200. If the server gets that packet and it looks at the time to live and it's 120 down from 127, well, that looks like a Windows box because there's no way we hit 80 something hops to get to our destination. That's not normal. See where I'm going? We can pretend by changing our settings and the way our system looks into tricking the device into thinking we're a device we are, are really not. In the 660 course that I teach, we, we do that actually on day one of the course. We pretend that we're an iPad, even though we're really a Linux box, and we trick the devices. That's really fun stuff. That's, that's an example of hacking, right? So um, that's we, we started that conversation by looking at the poll results. Unfortunately, we didn't get too many results there, but network segmentation is a big one, and that's what we started out with. We need to partition out the network so that the data center is protected, that you can't just SSH into it as a regular user in the marketing group. There are many other protections. NAC is an example of one. You ever go to um, a university or to a, a coffee shop or a hotel or a conference room and you see that there's an open access point. So you connect to it and you try to go to Google and it redirects you to a server that says, welcome to the hotel network. Please enter your room number and your last name. We'll bill you $10 per day. Well, I don't want to pay for this. So what we can do is sniff, look around on the network and say, well, I see a bunch of people using this network. I see their systems. Most users, and what I, when I say this in a room, when I say this in a room, I say, how many of you when you go to sleep at night, when you're on travel at a hotel, when you're doing your very last TikTok lookup or YouTube search, and you're like, I gotta go to bed. Do you actually go and find a log out URL associated with that network you're on to depart properly? No, nobody does that. There might not even be a log out URL. We just shut the lid or turn the phone or whatever. What I'm looking for, if you wanna hack this and I don't wanna pay, I can see that your system was on the network because of its IP and MAC address. And I see that you were there, but now you're not talking very much. Like I don't see your IP address pop up anymore on my sniffer. So I'm gonna change my MAC address and my IP address to be you. And now I'm just able to, uh, because the session, once you authenticate to that environment, the session is based on your IP address and MAC address. So if I change it to yours, I can use a network with your session, which is super simple, but super effective. But that's an example of a control, NAC. What's a couple other examples of controls, Jump as well? I was gonna actually pile on, on your story. I was gonna say do you it. can do that on the, in airlines as well when you have to pay for uh, in-flight Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, other, other controls, well, you have certificate-based as well, right? Sometimes you have to push certificates to clients and only people that have the correct certificates can actually allow uh, to to access specific resources in a network as well. So that's uh, that's another one that I typically 
see sometimes as well, especially uh, the case with uh, with wireless actually. So a lot of these uh, these wireless access points have certificate based authentication uh, as well, which you can use. So that's actually pretty good because that's significantly harder to actually steal or try to impersonate. Yeah, so there's there's a ton of network controls, but uh, they're they're critical. You, you really need to have them. I mean, obviously, pen testers are going to be looking to see what you have, so you know you got to ramp up that uh, security. That's why purple teaming became such a big thing, which is still a big thing, and we need to make it bigger. Which is historically, and then we're going to stop here because I can go on forever. So so control for well. Um, historically, your red your red side, your attacker side, you know, your in-house penetration testing and security people. Um, on the offensive are, are on one side and you got your defense like server admins on the other side and they're reporting to a manager and the other people are reporting to a different manager. So different or areas in the org chart, but you're, you're trying to accomplish the same goal. You're working towards the same objective, which is to secure your organization. Hello, Massachusetts. <laughs> and um, if you're not talking, if these two groups aren't talking, then that's obviously not a good thing. You you want these two groups to be talking to help each other because historically in traditional pen testing, Jean-Francois would come in, he'd run a pen test. Egypt, well, wow, awesome. Um, he would come in and he would run a pen test and he would own your network, record a bunch of information, turn over the results to you and say, here you go, go fix it. He's not going to stick around unless you pay consulting to, to help you harden your network. So wouldn't it be better to tell the defense what you're going to be doing so they can watch and they can see what's happening and if you're able to get in you can work with them and say here's how i did it this credential guard would have stopped me from running mini cats against your lsas process so let's implement credential guard and then we'll try it again look it it, it, it breaks my attack so now let me figure out how i want to do use a different technique to accomplish the same goal um and we work together to solve these problems so that when your red team engagement comes in your annual red team maybe when they're emulating different adversaries and they're trying to test your sock to see if you're catching what they're doing, if they're able to get in and expand their influence and do data exfiltration, you want that to not be so successful. And you continue to work together on this, this purple team operation. That's why that's what I also say in 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 my class in the 565 course is so you red teaming is considered to be something that is um pretty sophisticated. Well, sometimes you are going to start with a, a lesser sophisticated adversary, but my point here is that you don't want to perform a red team engagement and have an, a client or organization pay top dollar for something that pen testers would also be able to find. What I mean by that is if your organization hasn't done a proper vulnerability scan or vulnerability management program or a pen test before, or maybe you have done pen tests before, but you didn't actually remediate the findings, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to actually start doing a red team engagement. A lot of companies nowadays try to get a red team engagement as fast as possible, right? Because it's sexy. It's like the, the new kid on the block. Oh, we need to do a red team assessment against our environment. But if you've never done an engagement before, if you don't know your threat landscape, your, your, your attack surface, then of course, paying so much for a red team is just going to have a negative effect on you because you're actually wasting money that you probably would have spent on actually fixing off some of these underlying issues. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. So we're going to wrap it up. I saw one quick question uh, as a blue team, how can we detect Mac and IP spoofing and such? I mean, certificate based authentication that Jean-Francois mentioned, that's a great uh, tool to use because then I wouldn't be able to do those things. There are other techniques as well. I mean, obviously user awareness training and such, telling people to log out and all. Because um, if someone's actively using their IP address and Mac address and you spoof them, it's going to cause problems on the network. That's why we look for departed, but still session-based uh, users to go and spoof. And there's different types of NAC. The NAC we talked about initially was a dissolvable NAC that's used in environments where we have to allow many different types of systems and devices and browser to connect to us versus a more enterprise NAC where we can lock things down more. Um, UB keys and such is another way to, to make it so you can't just um, do multi-factor authentication bypass because there's hardware encryption that was set up previously. Like There's a lot of things we can do. But um, the yeah, outdated equipment is a big problem. <laughs> you, you ever go into a do a pen test and you and you see a router and it's like uptime, three years, 25 weeks, two days. It's like, 
whoa, I think it's not been updated in that long. So let's wrap it up here. I do, and we would love to see you at Hackfest in Hollywood, November 16th and 17th. And uh, if you're there, or if you want more information about it, you see my details pop up on Twitter and how you can reach me via DM and such. Happy to have a chat. But otherwise, have a great week. Thank you for tuning in. And I'm going to hand it back to the powers that be.